Good day to you one and all. It is I, Justin Hawkins, and this is Justin Hawkins Rides Again. Um, today is comments day, wherein I regard a carefully curated selection of your missives, and I react to them in the only way I know how. From the bottom of my heart. Justin Hawkins Rides Again. Again. The first thing I'm going to do is uh, say a super thanks to all of my super thanks people who have very kindly donated to me this week. Um, Jakob Hopperman, hello. Witch Horns Ghost, thank you. Tracy Johnson, Wicker Marn, again, nice one. Cashel O'Reilly, Daniel Skula, Miles Glasgow, Rocco Pellerin, Chris Johnson, Joel Boone, ADE87, Ollie the Wise Man, Jim Freak, Thomas van der Hoek. Uh, no cover charge, the only red special, Alex K, Paul Zedler, John Crider, Bank Slate, or oh, sorry, Blank Slate, <laughs> yeah. um, Sweet Pandora, uh, Johnny Engfeld, hello, Ash Lawrenson, Jack Tilly, Stephen Cree, Joey Robinson, Bart VK, Ken C, Prepped, William Perkins, and Reed Jorgensen. Nice one, guys. I really appreciate that. That's uh, it's very generous of you. Alex, uh, Kwiat Tovsky. I'm sorry if I made a pig's ear of that. Hi, Justin. I discovered this channel by one of the Jack White's videos. <laughs> I really enjoyed to start or end the day with one of your videos. I've always wondered, please forgive me or ignore the question if it seems to be rude. <laughs> That's cool. Um, did you have any bad moments stroke a grudge against listeners <laughs> when, the darkness po when the darkness's popularity dropped? <laughs> <laughs> despite still recording great or better albums. Um, I think the same thing happens to many artists like Jack White, who I would consider, I would not consider that Next Project's album after Elephant were any worse. They were even better. Yeah, I think that's true. I think after Elephant, he did some amazing stuff. Are there any bad feelings about releasing great pieces of work and not getting recognition that you previously had in terms of mainstream stroke commercial point of view? Um, I don't know really because... You know, you, you've got to say that the success that we had on our first record, it was it was surprising to everybody, including us, really. Um, we would have um, been quite happy to just have, like, a, an album that was out there and, you know, maybe earn us a few more fans or just gave our fans something to sing along at, at the gigs. We, it, we didn't expect it to take off the way it did, so that was just a bonus, really. And then when it sort of reverts to a, a normal amount of uh, popularity, which I, know, I think we do quite well, really, I mean, considering the type of rock that we play and the people that we are, you know, we, we, do, we do well, really. Um, so I don't think there's any... We don't have a grudge against um, listeners who have turned turned their back on us. I think that's the nature of popularity. You're, you're in the, you know, the mainstream and spotlight for a little while, um, but that that exact type of listenership is a very um, what's the word? Transient. It's a very transient listenership who will move on to the next thing. You know, and the ones that stay are the ones that sustain you afterwards, and and those are the ones that we care about then and we can't possibly bear a grudge against them because they consume everything we do and follow us around and watch us play live and make this whole thing possible really so i think it's just i think if you have any success just enjoy it while you can because you never know how long it's going to last and in our instance it didn't last very long but uh, at least we had a laugh you know um so yeah thanks for your question nice one um, I didn't think that was rude at all, by the way. Thanks for asking it. For comments day, on the topic of older singers losing it, I saw Brian Adams recently and his voice is off the chart amazing. What's he got that Bon Jovi, etc. doesn't? Also, is that a room in your house you shoot from? P.S. I toured of you back in the hot leg days. <laughs> we, played fi fives to we played fives together at some uni. Ah, okay. S thought you were a top bloke. You mean five-a-side soccer balls? Yes, I do like a game of football. Nice to see you prepped. The room that I'm shooting from is a lavishly appointed YouTube studio, purpose-built by moi for you, um, so that I might do this stuff in some comfort, really. Um, it's not far from where I live. Uh, I can't be very specific about the location because, you know, I don't want people turning up at the door, do I? Sort of banging on there saying, yeah, well, how comes you never listened to that other one by... Dumpy's Rusty Nuts or whatever, you know, 
It's, it is in my house. Damn it. I admitted it. Um, so, yeah, Brian Adams. Uh, uh, well, he's a vegan, first of all, so he looks after himself. You know, you know that he's doing all the right things, you know, to maintain that body and the physique. And, and as I've said many times, like the, the nature of your voice and, and in its essence, you know, what, what it really is, is, it's all determined by your anatomy. And then it's up to you to sort of be responsible to, to keep that thing on the road. And he's doing all the right things. That's, that's really all there is to it, I think. There's also one other thing which is difficult to quantify, and that's luck. He's just lucky. Um, but, you know, all, that, all the animals is saved and all the decisions is made that have, that have been for the good of the, you know, for example, not wanting to put songs in Top Gun because he doesn't agree with uh, glamorizing war. Those kind of things that you hear about Brian Adams. Obviously, he's a great guy. And um, and I think the heavens have smiled upon him and bestowed uh, some longevity to a voice that you would imagine would be quite difficult to maintain because he really does roar when he sings. It's like properly gritty. It's, you know, he's got a great voice. And uh, I'm really happy that he can still do it. Um, Matt Armitage. Comments day. For your next Q&A day, a few years ago I watched a John Grant show and I couldn't take my eyes off the incredible budgie who was drumming on the tour. Which musician have you been most mesmerised by as a gig-goer? Thanks for the channel. Um, awesome. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, you know, I always watch drummers as well. I love John Grant. That's a good call. I'd, li I'd like to go and see him live. I uh, think he's a brilliant songwriter, great lyricist. And, uh, yeah, I think, it's to be honest, I'm one of those people that goes to a gig and I just watch the drummer. It's, uh, I don't know why, but I think it all starts there. Maybe I'm a frustrated drummer. Maybe that's what I should should have done during lockdown is, uh, you know, learn how to play drums properly. But um, I really admire Ilan Rubin, uh, who plays drums for Nine Inch Nails. I saw them a while ago and he's powerful, exciting to watch and um, you know, lovely head of hair as well. So brilliant. Um, <laughs> just just your man's man. It's natural to, to, to stare at a person like that. <coughs> okay, one one two one three one four one five one nine one two one three one. Hi Justin, what are some of your favourite songs you've written for other artists that we might not know about? Okay, well there's a song on Adam Lambert's first record, the uh, called Music Again, that was the first track of it's track one of his first album. I wrote um a song for there's a few actually I, did, I wrote a song for um a band called planet of women um which is called put your clothes back on see none of them are really songs for people they're just songs that i've written that have ended up being sung by people but there's one that's caleb johnson when he when he won uh, american idol <laughs> it was called as long as you love me not like the kelly clarkson song but um and so he sang that as his coronation single when he won so he sang that in the final and then won it and then released it but Un unbeknownst to me that it had already been sung and released by another idol winner uh, the South African idol winner but because uh, the royalties take a long time to be collected and come in from South Africa I, I didn't actually realise that they'd ended up using that song um, and so I got into a bit of trouble because uh, two separate idols from two separate territories had sung the same song and that's not really allowed so they got upset with me I was like well you are the idol organisation. You know, what do you think? It's, uh, what am I supposed to do? It's like somebody says, "Can I sing your song?" Here's some money. I'm going to go. Yeah, all right. <laughs> it's my job. Anyway, not to worry. Um, what else do I do? Oh, loads of stuff. It's all out there. Okay, so Team Driver Lot says, "Big fan here. My name is Andreas, and my question is, what what music started your love for rock and roll?" I think it, for me it all goes back to Queen. I was listening to uh, that's why I've got this uh, incredible tattoo of. Can you see that? Is that working? Ah, here we go. So that's a tattoo of Queen uh, from the Hot Space artwork, which is probably the album that most Queen enthusiasts or the least Queen enthusiasts like, and Queen themselves probably disown to a degree. I think there's some great stuff on that record. No such thing as a bad Queen album. That's that's the rule of it. Um, but when I was, you know, four or five years old, I can remember Mum and Dad playing uh, jazz and um, Night at the Opera, and then hearing those sounds permeate up through the floor when they're having their parties and just laying in bed going, oh yeah, rock and roll music's brilliant. My parents are having a great time with their friends downstairs. It must be what I should listen to when I get a bit older. 
Um, and then from there, I was just sort of drawn to the the sort of uh, friend groups that are all into the same stuff, really. And I ended up sort of rolling with the Grebos, um, who all listen to stuff like um, the Cult, um, ACDC, um, you know, guitar-based rock, a lot of Aerosmith as well. A lot of Aerosmith. A lot of Aerosmith. Radical Gambino says, Question, Justin, of your generation up till now, has the best rock and roll come from USA or UK? And also, do you prefer recordings and production from America or in the UK? Wow, that's a good question. I always think about, like, um, ACDC. Because I think they sort of defined a really... You know, they they established a blueprint for pub rock that is just hard to beat. But then I always think about when you're driving in America, the experience of listening to it is going to be totally different to the experience of listening to it in Amer- in England when you're driving because you drive on the other side of the road. So, you know, when you have Malcolm on one side and Angus on the other side, if you're in America, you're going to be sitting nearer to... Uh, I suppose you're going to be sitting nearer to what, to what Angus is doing, you know, so you're going to hear a lot more of the lead stuff. And then over the other side... I think if you're driving in... Oh, no, wait. No, I think... Sorry, if you're in America, you're going to hear a lot of Angus. And if you're in England, you're going to hear a lot of Malcolm. Is that even right? I don't know. Um, I always thought that they should switch the the speakers around um, according to which country you're in. Just because driving rock... Oh, rock is an important part of driving, isn't it? Um, I don't know what... It's, it's a difficult question. I, I think it transcends, you know, the Atlantic boundaries. I mean, one of my favourite bands is Foreigner and they're named Foreigner because some of them are American, some of them are English and whichever country they're in, they're foreigners, you know. Um, so I I think it's hard to if, if think what you're up against really is that Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, The Cult um, and all the others versus Aerosmith and all the others. I don't know. Who knows? It's a constant and ongoing cultural exchange. I mean, let's face it, Led Zeppelin wouldn't be Led Zeppelin had they not um, tried to do like their sort of folk-inspired version of that particular blues thing that was happening in the Americas much earlier. And then Aerosmith probably wouldn't sound like Aerosmith if they hadn't you know, listened to Led Zeppelin and worked out how, how to most effectively and dynamically achieve a uh, riff, uh, make a riff sound good. And I, I've read, I think I read that Stephen Davis biography called Walk This Way, where they're talking about, oh, Stephen Tyler discovered uh, Led Zeppelin and said, look, now we've got to play it where everyone plays the same thing, including the bass and the two guitars. That's how you do riffs. And they learned that from Led Zeppelin, and Led Zeppelin learned from American things. So I, d- I do believe that the, there's a transatlantic cultural exchange that enables uh, rock music to grow and evolve and snowball. And that's what it's all about. Um, it's that thing of sharing tips and, uh, you know, it's the ongoing uh, Saturday swap shop of uh, cultural inspiration. So anyway, thanks a lot for all of your um, comments. Uh, I'll always try to answer them as honestly as I can. I love you all very much and I will see you on the ice. Nice one. Justin Hawkins writes again. Again. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, watch one of these two videos and keep coming back. Nice one, guys. Love you very much indeed.